So our classic character profile this week is somebody who has seen plenty of time in the dock, plenty of time behind bars. He is um, the proverbial bad penny of the street. Somebody who's been popping up and uh, back and forth again for many a year. It is Terry Duckworth we're talking about this week. Yes, Terry Duckworth. What a wrong un. He he is, and he's like an enduring wrong un on the street, isn't he? He's like because so so many of the the villains on Coronation Street have their like little villainous storyline. It like builds up to them um, murdering someone or, or whatever, and then they're gone. But I, I do like how um, Terry. Yeah, like, I like comes... I like having like a, a villain that, that keeps coming back. Yeah, and like oh, you know, there's going to be trouble when Terry Duckworth's about. Exactly. So Gemma, tell us about his vital statistics. He was born on the fourth of June, nineteen sixty four, and has a waist circumference of forty two inches. <laughs> you made that up. Um, his parents are Jack and Vera Duckworth, and he has a wife, Lisa Horton, oh, in nineteen ninety two, and he has three children. Paul Clayton, who was born in 1986. Tommy Duckworth. Oh, what happened to Tommy? Oh, he left. I love Tommy. He born... didn't. He has... Why well, hasn't he even come back since Tina's murdered? He clearly sucked. doesn't care about her. He was born in 1992, which is stupid. <laughs> um, and Brad Armstrong, who was born in 1997. And Terry Duckworth first appeared on the 1st of August in 1983. That was less than a month after I first appeared. Mm. In the world. You're like, oh, really? Here's Terry, let's go. And um, he last appeared on the 11th of May 2012. But that's not to say that he won't come back. He might come back, we'll talk about that he later. Was, he's been in 363 episodes and he's played by Nigel Pivaro. Mm, I love that name. Do you? <laughs> yes, I think it's a cool Do you name. Want to say it? Nigel Pivaro. Do you wish that was your name? Yeah, it's a cool name. It sounds like a stage it's name. A but good, it's a good actor's name. Yes. So with 363 appearances, that doesn't put him in the top 100 or anything. No. But he's still quite but an he's iconic... He's in the top 100 of your heart, isn't he? He is. He's quite an iconic Coronation Street character. But things could have been so much differently because Nigel originally auditioned for the role of Curly Watts. And I can't imagine him being Curly at all because no. the whole point of Curly was supposed to be like this lanky, nerdy boffing kind of character and I don't think Nigel could have played well neither did the casting people because they didn't, wouldn't, they didn't cast him did they no they've invited him back though to um, audition for Terry um, and because back at the time in 1983 they wanted to have like a new young comedy trio it's like a, a replacement for Elsie, not Elsie, uh, Ina and Minnie and um, Martha in the snug so they got um, Curly and Kevin and Terry were all brought in sort of in quick succession that year and um, Terry was more of a comedy character at first. He was a, a bit of a Jack the Lad, I guess. But um, it wasn't until a few years later that he was nasty. I mean, he was always a bit of a, a chancer and a bit of a, a petty petty criminal, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or, and a, a, a philanderer. But um, he wasn't sort of proper proper nasty until the whole selling his son storyline oh, came yeah, on. You mellow, don't you, Blade? Mm. So anyway, yeah, he came in in 1983. Now, he just had a stint in the Parachute Regiment, apparently, um, and he'd moved in with Jack and Vera on Coronation Street and got a job in an abattoir for a bit. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. In 1984, he fell out with Curly after Sharon Gaskell turned... Curly, Curly down. down to go to a U2 concert with Terry. Wow. Um, later that year, Terry and Kevin start double dating and eventually enlist Curly to go with one of their girlfriend's other mates. <laughs> this is complicated. Um, he gets fed up with his with uh, Jack and Vera rowing and then he goes and moves in with the Ogdens for a bit. But he comes back because he doesn't like having to do errands for Stan. Yeah, he liked being doted on by Hilda, and Hilda liked having somebody there. But yeah, he he got a bit fed up with it. So he went back to Jack and Vera after a little while. And then in 1985, he sets up a business, a removal business, called Cheap and Cheerful um, with Curly after he bought Mike Baldwin's van for £800. So up until this point, it's all very sort of low-level kind of... Yeah, exactly. It's all entrepreneurial dabbling and dating and just being a, a northern lad. Exactly. Um, 1986 wag. got into a bit of trouble because he accidentally got Andrea Clayton pregnant, who was his next door neighbour, and she gives birth to... It's quite an accident. Yeah. Gives birth to baby Paul, um, but the Claytons leave the street with Terry not being allowed to even see him. So Aww. sad. 
probably, and that's what, 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 what scarred him for life. So we get to see um, a bit more of his naughty side in 1987 when he stole some booze from the corner shop. Um, and then it was um, this was it was found it was drunk at a party at number thirteen, and um, it looked like Hilda was going to get in trouble for it. So he um, kind of fessed up for it and and it's, took it's, one for the team. Exactly. So it's still showing that he's got a good side back then. He wasn't like a sort of rotten to the core or anything. He didn't do that now. No. Um, he also started buying and selling household goods on the side, but. Um, Emily, who was the bookkeeper of uh, Cheap, Cheap and Cheerful, disapproved of the fact that he told his customers that he was unemployed to try and like get some sympathy and to try and get him to sell all these, How would uh, to you buy say all these I'm things. unemployed when you're... Well, no, I think he was saying that... I, I think it was just he used to like go door to door with these really? boxes of stuff saying, oh, I haven't got a job, can you buy some of these off of me? That kind of thing. Mm. But actually, he did. Um... He also started sleeping with Dulcie Froggart, who was a woman that he met whilst he was on his rounds, and was horrified to discover that Jack was also having an affair uh, with her. Dirty. I know, it's gross, isn't it? Yes. Um, and um, I didn't know he knew the director, Peter Jackson, but he actually was in the <laughs> army with him. I think it's a different Peter Jackson. <laughs> he convinced his old army mate, Peter Jackson. He was played by um, Ian Mercer, who later went on to play Gary Mallet. Yeah, um, to join Cheap and Cheerful before he jumped into bed with his wife. And so they, they end up leaving Weatherfield together. Yeah. So it seems like um, Terry is a bit of a bed hopper back then, and that was some of the worst that he would do. And I don't know. Some people would say that was very bad. And some people would just so say, well, horrid. some people would say that he is just, just t- taking lads, a chance. Just lads being lads, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Exactly. That's what we all do. Just, oh, just being hopping. lads. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so from 1980... Just the bants, isn't it? Exactly. 1987 onwards, um, he was just like... That's this is when he was in and out for it. and he, So he was never, I don't think, like a permanent cast member again. But he would come back for a few episodes and then go away again. And sort of at the time, Nigel Bavaro would go off and do a few other acting bits. And he became a, a journalist for a bit sort of after this. But, um, what the, a silly job. His first... Um, Returned to Coronation Street was next year in 1988, where he um, got a job at the factory. Uh, I didn't really understand this when I was reading the notes for it, but he wasn't particularly he wasn't happy to see that Kevin is now happily married. I think he liked the idea of him and Curly and Kevin being all bachelors together, so he tried to split him and Sally up by um, getting a, one of the girls at the factory, Mandy, to pretend to Sally that she was having an affair with Kevin. That didn't work anyway because um, she he eventually got a though Sally was able to sort of rumble her so that was a bit weird and he got fired from the factory that year because um, he took another girlfriend out that he had in Mike Baldwin's Jaguar and um, ended up having stay away from my wife sprayed onto it so yet again he's been dabbling with a married woman naughty 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 boy in 1992 he comes back to the street with his pregnant girlfriend Lisa Horton with him um, and then he gets um, arrested for GBH and sent to prison on remand. Yeah, this was quite a famous um, little Terry scene because um, he was out in prison, but he got let out to marry Lisa. So he, they should have just got him to marry in prison like Fizz and, Fizz and John did. But they got married in a church, I think. Um, but he gave the guards the slip because um, he wanted to, he convinced them to take his... Um, handcuffs off for the official photos and then um, he escapes although is later caught a few days afterwards after Reg Holdsworth spots him secretly meeting up with Vera at Better Buys and he was sent to prison for three more years then. So Lisa was left wondering whether or not um, Terry actually even loved her at all. Lisa gave birth to baby Tommy later that year in 1992 and they all went to live with her parents the Hawthorns in Blackpool. Um, 1993, tragedy struck. Lisa was killed after being knocked down by a car, leaving Jack and Vera holding the baby. Um, at Christmas, Tommy was released for good behaviour, which doesn't Tommy. sound like... Oh, it's Tommy? Oh, it should say Terry. Terry is released for good behaviour. That doesn't sound like Terry at all. Um, and he gave custody of Tommy to Lisa's parents for £2,000 a year, um, which got him punched in the face by Jack. And I think that's one of these... Actually, um, he's just seen the thing of himself. That was always... This is always a storyline or a clip that gets brought up in Corrie documentaries, like about the Duckworth or anything, doesn't it? I think that was yeah. quite a, a famous yeah. Duckworth moment with Jack punching him. Yeah. And um, that's the storyline that then got brought up, like, this must have been, like, 20 years later then, wasn't it, when um, Tommy oh, yeah. and, and, and Terry uh, sort of met again and was like, so saying, why sad. did you sell me? 
So that and this was this was the first proper time when I think you can say that Terry is definitely a proper nasty because nasty, jumping into other people's beds is one thing and selling stealing booze from the corner shop, but selling your own son that's Kylie. nasty. Kylie. <laughs> Especially as it was a Christmas storyline as well. When oh, everything dear. was supposed to be happy. What would Jesus do? He wouldn't do that. No. Um, in 1996, um, Tom, Terry took Tommy from the Hortons after um, Jeff, the, the, the dad, the granddad, threatened to stop paying the annual £2,000. But they eventually agreed for Terry to get a final lump sum of £10,000. And that would mean that he could look after Tommy until he turned 18. And um, Terry left the area again, although not before getting local mum Trisha Armstrong pregnant. So how old was um, Tommy at this point? He was four. And so £2,000 a year. I know, I was doing this. Five years. Head, that's so well. he's paid five years worth, which would have taken him up to when he was nine. So he's lost out on nine years yeah, worth he, of money. Yeah, but he's, he, was, he wasn't maybe not going to get anything at all, was he? Hmm. So you've got to cut your losses, haven't you? Yeah, well, Vera... And also, you, what, you, what are you, you're not thinking this through, Michael, because when they hit teenage years, a lot of parents would pay someone <laughs> to, take to them get off rid of hands. them. So, I think you'd be the smart Tommy's mover. Tommy's best years were behind her. Exactly. He was still a cute four-year-old. He was still quite marketable. Mm, that's true. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, Vera wrote Terry out of her will at that point, and Jack disowns him completely. What? I have no son. Aww. By the time Trisha gave birth in 1997, um, Terry was back on the street, barely even remembering who he is. But because who she, she is, who, not she, who he is, who she is, she is. <laughs> although because she was living in the Rovers at the time, which um, Jack and Vera, I think they were the, they were owners there, um, he was sort of feigned interest in the baby so that he could try and get at the Rovers' takings. Mm. Um, and he um, one day um, tricks Jack. Or t- tries to get Jack to let him take the takings to the bank because he wants to scarf off with them. But Jack, um, he knows, sees, what, he's he knows what he's up to, and he gave, gives him a wallet full of um, cut-up newspapers to trick him. And so Oops. Terry was off again. Yes. After he um, after he rumbled, well, after he was caught out, I guess. So 1999, back up again, shows up on the street after hearing that Jack has had a heart attack because he's hoping for a little bit of inheritance and he's a bit disappointed to find out that Jack's actually okay, he's not dead at all. He then sold Vera a dodgy second-hand car. Um, So this was like, um, I don't understand cars, but I think it was one of these ones that was like pieced together from different bits of cars. That was kind of a really, like a bit of a scandal. I remember, do you remember them in the news when people realised that a lot of some cars were being sold and they were actually welded together from two cars that had been in a smash. No. Yeah, there was quite a lot of scandals about things like that. Oh, okay, well, this I don't know when it was, but I do remember seeing, like, exposés on the, like, watchdog and things like that, where they, you go through the car and if you pull the upholstery off, you can see where they welded the the two bits together. Oh, well, that's exactly what this was. And then the the car ended up having something wrong with it and got... Vera and Judy into a crash and then of course that's the crash that made Julie then have her embolism and then um, die. So wow, wow. really that's all Terry's fault. It's all his fault. Yeah and Vera disowned him again. Um, but... You can only disown someone once Vera. Well Vera was always um, a bit more forgiving of Terry well, anyway wasn't she? Heart, didn't she? Yeah whereas Jack was always like no he's a, he's a wrong and he's, he's nothing to do with me. That's kind of like a normal story trope for the parents isn't it like the dad's always the hard hearted no forgiveness and the mum's like the pushover that yeah takes you back in one of the storylines um i think it was it came after this oh yeah it was it was a couple of years later um jack finds out that vera doesn't think that terry might actually be his um and he's like no i i always knew that she had an affair and it could have been that Terry wasn't mine, but he's see he sees too much of himself in Terry, um, so he thinks he is. I don't. If I ever, if I, not that this would ever, happen to me, <laughs> but I I find it quite fascinating that guys can never really be a hundred percent sure, and I think that um, if I ever, if I was a guy and I ever found out that um, my girlfriend or wife whatever said that it's you know it's a chance it's not yours I'd have to know immediately I couldn't ever live with the question you would go with the the feeling of no oh my gut tells me I'm like nope 
blood test. <laughs> Down for hospital. Exactly. Um, so, 2000, he shows up on the street again. Oh no, that was what happened in 1999. I just missed, read, read the notes again. Oh, this is gonna be. This is another episode that I'm not able to edit because I'm trying to get it out as soon as we said it. But there's so much that I would normally edit it out of this. 2000. We sound so unprofessional, and it's all your fault. We do. Fault. We sound really unprofessional today. I'm very, very sorry, <laughs> listeners. And Gemma's already had a warm-up practice of a podcast this morning as well. Well, so I sound very good. You sound great. You. I've just been sitting around waiting for your day, and I'm tired now. 2000. He discovers that um, his son Paul needs a kidney transplant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I told I you, I can't even say a sentence. Blast. Transplant and agrees to be a donor, but for a price. However, he scarpers with the money before I'm um, going through the procedure, leaving Vera the only person that can do this kidney transplant, so she donates instead. Fortunate, unfortunately, she has an allergic reaction to something during the operation and almost dies. And I think that was the um, live episode for the 40th anniversary. And Liz Dawn did an excellent job of looking like she was on death's door for the whole episode she was like unconscious in a coma and they were and i remember watching that live episode thinking that vera was gonna like sneeze or twitch or something but she, she must have been terrifying for <laughs> her to have been like rival. on this live episode she's been preparing for this role her whole life i don't know what would be more difficult in a live episode just lying absolutely still or actually having some acting to do where you could have fluffed your lines i think i'd just take some kind of like paralytic <laughs> yeah um maybe maybe that's what they do do i don't know but um we do get... i do find it funny that um he offered to donate for a price and then ran off with the money and then vera had to do it anyway but she didn't get paid and she never she never like volunteered before this Very suspicious. <laughs> we actually got to see a bit of um of the softer side to terry though because um he shows up and i think again this was in the live episode and like looks through the window to check that she's fine and i remember, I remember watching it going oh my gosh they got terry back in it um but yeah he disappears into the night now i was reading some um a few interviews with nigel pavaro early when i was researching this very interesting find from i think february 2000 so like eight, nine, ten months before this was on, he was in an interview, which is on Corrie.net now. It was um, uh, an interview at the British Isles show in Canada. And he was asked, what would you do if you were in charge of the, the script? What, what storyline would you have for Terry? And he said, oh, maybe it would be something like um, one of his kids needs a, a kidney transplant. And I was thinking... Would he have known back then that that's what was going to happen? So I was just wondering. But I don't think he would have done. Like, in February, I don't think... Especially, remember, back then they would only have filmed, like, three or four weeks in yeah. advance. They I th- would have planned it a lot before then. I guess, maybe. It's weird, isn't it? Because, like, if it can't be that they heard him say that and went... Oh, yeah, yeah, that is a girl. Well, his, his storyline, his idea of what would happen was actually quite different because he yeah. wanted it to be like a, a story of sacrifice uh, for Terry. He wanted to redeem him and to have um, one of the children need a, a kidney transplant and he was the only one that would do it. Why but do he, you keep saying plant? It's, it's my northern accent coming through. Um, he would want to be the donor, but because of he didn't want to lose his bad lad reputation he said oh maybe he could like go diving or something and then purposely run out of air and then end up sacrificing himself so that he would then he could then have his organs harvested and put into this um child so it doesn't make any sense (laughs) it wasn't exactly what happened but i did think it was a bit of a coincidence that something similar did happen this actor went on to write to be a journalist writing um factual stuff not making up stories because if that's the as his imagination i don't think he would make very good it is int- i thought it was quite interesting for him to think that um terry should sort of be noble and do this sacrifice that nobody would have known about because it, it was if you if you character. if you play a villain i guess you must sympathize with them a little bit and you must like look for the reasons about why they would You'd do this to, and everything to explain why you yeah, know, especially yeah. if it's like a, a long-running villainous character like this and mm. somebody who's 
yeah, not just been brought in to be evil and, and that's it. But anyway, um, 2001 then. So he's back in prison already after being framed for murder by a policeman because Terry had been sleeping with his wife. Oops. Bit of a, another common thread here. Um, and against his instincts, Jack agrees to help him out. And so he was released in early 2002, made peace with Jack and Vera, and then moved to Sheffield with his girlfriend Nadine, where he sold some double glazing. Um, he then moved to Wolverhampton and sold mobile phones. So, a bit of a come down from mm. life of a master criminal. And that was the last we saw of Terry until 2008, when um, Vera um, had sadly died in her chair. He was there for her funeral, although it was mostly to make sure that Jack wasn't going to want to move in with him, sort of be, be dependent on him. And this is, I think, the first time that Terry had met his son, Brad, I think. that, that was No, Paul. And he, he barely even recognised him. Um he told Jack not to sell the house to Tyrone and Molly, saying, look, you've got to keep it in the family. And then um, he disappeared off into the night again after saying, Paul, well, that's the last you'll probably see me of me again until Jack dies. But in fact, when Jack did die, Tyrone, um, Terry wasn't even there. He phoned up, no, Tyrone phoned up to Terry to say, look, are you going to come to your dad's funeral? And um, he said he was too far away to come. Aww. So that was a bit strange that they didn't bring back Terry for Jack's funeral because the amount over the years that he just pops in every now and again you'd have thought that he would turn up for Jack's funeral I don't know but maybe that would have what they should have done they should have had um, Terry turning up for Jack's funeral then sticking around for a bit and then they could have had him like involved in all the the dodgy dealings and the tram crash and everything because that happened just after that Mm, it would have been quite good to have had Terry stalking around in the tram crash although maybe it would have added an extra extra dimension that wasn't really needed anyway the last we saw of terry was in 2012 when he returned to the street to set up a nightclub called seventh heaven um and it was going to be under the viaduct where um the bistro is now so he meets tommy not realizing who he is thumps him for some reason and then um he wouldn't when he finds out, he still doesn't want anything to do with him until he discovers that Tommy's been left £12,000 in Jeff Horton's will. And he thinks to himself, I could have got 22000 off him back then. Exactly. So he's like, well, I, I need to get some of this money. He owes me. So he won over Tommy, got his trust and offered him a job. Um, Tyrone and Kirsty discovered that Terry had been bribing a councillor to get the club agreed to. Um, and he later persuaded Tommy to burn down the club because he actually owed money to loan shark Rick Nealon. But Tina stopped him. Oh, Tina. In the end, Terry fled the street, leaving Tommy to deal with Nealon himself. Wow, and that wow. was the last we have seen of Terry. Um, and I guess now that Tommy has... Um, Gone. <laughs> Gone, un- sort of unceremoniously being kicked off of the street after Chris found him as a naughty boy. It could possibly mean that we're not going to see any more Terry Duckworth, and that's kind of a bit sad. Cause I not... hope not. But he's got no one to antagonise apart from Tyrone, and Tyrone really doesn't like him. Yeah, but he's he's the one link now, isn't he? Because yeah. when um, Vera and Jack were disowning him, that was kind of the same time as they were starting to become a lot more uh, paternal to, Chummy. to Tyrone. Because <laughs> Tyrone is like... He's the, the son, the son they, they never they, had. They wished that they had had. So I think, yeah, and, and Terry is obviously jealous of the affection that Well, he won't like got. it if he comes back and he finds Tyrone living in that house. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess that there's always a, a possible link well, there. Well, he would have been living in that house in 2012, obviously, wouldn't he? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think yeah. he was. Well, there you go. But, yeah. I, I always think it was weird how he says Tyrone, because he calls him Tyrone, doesn't he? Do you remember that? Yeah, I do actually. Tyrone. Um, yeah, I so call Michelle. Michelle. Michelle, exactly the same thing. Um, so he could be back, but I think the idea of when they when they brought Tommy Duckworth back into it, they wanted to like keep the Duckworth name going, and I think if they'd have the Coronation Street producers had had their way, they would have probably kept Tommy in it for a long time, just so that they could say, "Oh, we've got a Duckworth on the yeah. show." A little bit like I guess when. They brought Dennis back and they're like, oh, we've got Tanners back in the show again. But um, I suppose there's still the possibility of like one of his many sons turning up on the street. Not that there's any particular reason for them to. I always thought that Tommy Duckworth was a, a sad ending to the legacy of the Duckworth family. Really, it was a very sad so ending. I'm not, I'm not sad that he's gone, but I am sad there isn't a Duckworth anymore. Yeah. Although, to be honest, I, it, well, yeah, it would have been better to just to have left it with Jack dying, wasn't it? Because that was such a perfect ending, I thought, for for Jack and Vera when Jack died. And yeah. then it's like a few months later, who's this 
scrappy oink idiot. turning up on the street. Oh, it's Tommy. Nobody really yeah. cares anymore. Well, there's no reason why um, one of his you can't he can't turn up and say oh, I had a kid that you don't know about, mm. and then he gets introduced. Yeah, maybe. I guess that um, Terry could just show, show up in prison the same way Jim does because yeah. Jim's got no rela- no link to to Peter yeah, exactly, particularly. Yeah. It's just like oh, here's a perfect opportunity to bring him back. So yeah, yeah. I guess they could have done that because we. I can certainly imagine Terry ending up in prison again. But, um, yeah, anyway, like I said before, while he's not been acting on the streets, Pivaro has gone on to do a couple of other TV shows. He was in Hetty Wayne's Prop Investigates. Apparently he played a policeman on that. I don't remember that at all. Um, and But he's also acted in many theatre productions, including Wuthering Heights and What the Butler Saw? Which are ones that I've heard of, so there's a load of ones that he hadn't heard of. Now, I thought this was a very interesting fact about Nigel Bavaro. In 2006, he graduated from the University of Wales with an MSc in Social Sciences and Economics, specialising in terrorism and international relations. Excellent. Who'd have thought that? If that if that sounds like a very thing, exciting degree to have. There's one thing to go into these days, it's terrorism <laughs> and international relations. Everybody needs somebody who can... Um, Solve terrorist problems. Yeah, I'll just say, just explain that, yeah, that's a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you do with a terrorism degree? I mean, an anti-terrorism degree? You become a journalist, because that's what he did later on in 2006, working at the Manchester Evening News, and then the Thameside Reporter, but then before becoming a freelance journalist. He was, like, doing columns in the Star and everything. He also did... Um, TV documentaries, a writer and a presenter in a few of them. Um, and he even got an award in 2009 for the Plain English Campaign for Clear and Accessible Language in Journalism. <laughs> they give out awards for anything these days. That's like, why wasn't there like a grammar award for making sure every sentence ends in a full stop? Oh, that's so weird. That sounds like one of those, like um, a campaign started deliberately for people who don't like to use the sauruses or... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, well done for that award. Um, he's been very outspoken as well about the urban regeneration in Salford and some of the um, documentaries that he was um, he, that he wrote and starred in were sort of moaning about all the the modern modernisation of the, the the area. Mm-hmm. And um, he's even criticised um, Media City, which makes it makes a, me a think, think he's maybe come back. he's not going to come back. He's he calls it a cathedral of corporatism, or he has called it that once well, that's on a Radio plain Four English. interview. No, it's not. That's a that's a total metaphor. Mm. But um, yeah. So I, I that, you're actually you're right. Actually, maybe he won't come back because he's lost has he his burnt, copy book. Has he burnt his bridges with ITV and Media City? Possibly. Maybe. Um. So in 2009, Terry was voted one of Soap's top ten villains in uh, the People newspaper, and not just Coronation Street, Soap in general. So that's quite a high award. I mean, so obviously we don't watch yeah. any of the other soaps, but. Is, is is he deserving of that title? I guess. It, I mean, if you if you're listing the top ten villains, you're going to have your Richard Hillmans and your Den Watts and and everything in there, aren't you? But I think it's now you t- tell me about Nick Cotton because I hear about him in EastEnders a lot. Is he? Do you yeah. know? Can you tell me anything about? I him? don't Does remember a lot about him. He was just yeah, Dot's wrong in son. He was on dr- a druggie and yeah, always used to turn up and ruin things. Does and, he seem like a bit of an equivalent to, to Terry Duckworth? Try to suck up and be a good son and be like, oh, sorry, ma, and then screw up again. And Dot would be like, oh. Yeah, it sounds quite similar, actually, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I I think he. He's never gonna. Be, he's not like a major, major villain because he hasn't had the massive storylines like Richard and, yeah. and Lewis and everything. But for the for sheer determination and keeping Duff on and going Chester. back, I think I think he's got to be. Um, a top he's a plucky villain. little wrong in, isn't he? Yeah, and it, yeah, it's just nice to have the idea of a returning villain. It's like when you're watching a pantomime and then from the side of the stage the villain comes on yeah. and everyone's like, ooh, he's behind you. I think yeah. I think Soaps needs someone like that. It's just nice to have a villain that doesn't turn into a murderer and then well, gets Well, yeah, once up. they get once they start murdering people, that's when they get kicked out. Yeah, it's like, yeah, the writing's on the wall for them. But I think mm-hmm. they'd be stupid to have a, a final story for Terry. They always need to have the possibility of bringing him back, which is why this scuba diving sacrifice would have been um, a shame if that had... It happened, but that's why I quite like Tracy being in it. Yeah, because she is just like the villain of the street, isn't she? Yeah, but but gets away with it. Got away with murder, hasn't she? Literally. Um, 
That was a miscarriage of justice. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Tracy. So, little fi- end of the quote from Pavaro about Terry. He said this in 2012. He's what I'd call an ordinary, decent criminal. He doesn't go through life wanting to be bad. He's bad because of circumstance. He became this chancer in order to survive. But there are certain lines he wouldn't cross. I don't know if there are certain lines he, he wouldn't, wouldn't cross. Murder people. He doesn't seem the murderous type. And, and you get soap villains that, like, just turn into murderers whether or not it suits their character mm-hmm. or not because if they want a big exit for a character they say oh let's have a murder so on but yeah I don't think Terry is like they that do he's make more it like quite... a con man isn't he they do make it look quite easy on soaps to accidentally kill somebody yeah and I guess Terry could have accidentally killed somebody and then he would have tried to get away with it which I suppose is almost what in a way what happened to Richard when he accidentally smashed Trisha on the head with a shovel whoops <laughs> it, Dougie Ferguson was kind of an accident and not really not really Richard's fault. But yeah, anyway. so there we go. There's Terry. Proper, proper wrong and mm-hmm. Bad penny of the street. And um, I do hope he'll be back in it again. But he he's, he is better off coming and going because I don't think there's particularly any room for somebody quite as nasty as him to be a permanent character. And I wouldn't like to see him settle down with a, with a family or anything. It'd be a bit of a damn squib for his character, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs>